And from 25 to 105, you are using and can improve your cognitive abilities by using both right brain and left brain. So it's very important for people, for instance, if you're always a mathematician, you've always been an accountant, that person should also look to do something creative, to take maybe a dance class or to take a painting class, because that balance between right brain and left brain enhances our brain wellness. How very, very interesting. I never thought of my thoughts as coming from a right or the left brain. So the more you diversify, the healthier you are. Yes, absolutely. And this came out of the research of Marion Diamond in UCLA, where she studied the brains of individuals who had passed on. And she saw that the brains, the, specifically the hippocampus, is thicker and plumper in individuals who have higher education. The hippo what? It's called the hippocampus. 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 It's a, it's, we have two of them. It's right in the middle of our head, yeah. above our ears. And that's the area of our brain that can grow with use or shrink if we don't use it. So if you go home at age 65 and sit on a couch, your hippocampus is going to shrink up. If you go out and you're active and engaged, your hippocampus can change mass, shape, and density. Now well, that's why they say what you don't use, you lose. That's exactly right. <laughs> and so yes. the TAP method is mm -hmm. that now formulated and uh, built on using the arts, whether it be music, dance, movement, to mm -hmm. enhance our brain wellness, which hopefully we will look to prevent cognitive decline with specifically people with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease. Because if you keep people engaged and active, then the brain can thwart off getting these abnormal plaques and tangles. Yeah, I can see that when people become like elderly and they're all alone and you sit in their room in the dark, exactly. how everything stops. Yes, yes. Well, I would like to know where are you from? Where were you born? Well, I actually was born in the Bronx, and oh, I've Bronx. Been, uh, for three years, and then I moved to Westchester. Um, my background, I first was, uh, first and foremost, was always an artist. I thought I was going to teach art at a very young age. What type of art? Uh, um, I did sculpture and painting. I'm an uh -huh. avid oil painter today. Wow. Uh, matter of fact, the cover is a, one of my oil paintings. Oh. And I use my oil paintings in some of the uh, products that I've developed for individuals to interact, arts for interaction, so that mm -hmm. arts are developed so that I could interact with you over an activity. And so I have a master's in art therapy and I have a master's in therapeutic recreation. And my PhD was from NYU in studying health education and looking at cognitive impairments through therapeutic activities. And so my dissertation research mm -hmm. looked at 120 individuals in five different nursing homes in New York City. And I looked at the very first day they went into the nursing home, and then 365 days later. And the individuals only had to have mild Alzheimer's disease. So they couldn't have a broken hip, they couldn't be on any medicine. Mm -hmm. And my study showed that those people who engaged in therapeutic activities ac more across that year had higher levels of cognitive abilities at the end of 360 days, and those that didn't engage in activities had lower cognitive abilities and lower psychosocial well-being. So it makes us more aware that to be engaged and to talk and be part of a group, even if it's an arts group, can keep mm -hmm. us well. That's very, very interesting. So you must have uh, really been very ambitious to find out more and more. About yeah, I was this very, person. I was like a sponge, very hungry <laughs> to find out more information. Mm -hmm. And then decided to write my book because I felt that it was filling a niche that we have not had ever before. We never knew how important the arts have been. Matter of fact, we've gone through, what, two decades where they've taken art out of the schools. Well, my book uh -huh. is a reason to put arts back into the schools because arts, now we know, impacts our brain directly. So, right. 
So anybody else in your family uh, is interested in things like this? No, I'm the only one. <laughs> You're the only I'm one. I'm the only one. Yes, and do uh, you have any siblings that... Uh, well, I have, yes, I have two sisters. Um, um, both my parents are alive. Uh, my husband and I have four children of my own. Oh, my I'm children might end up going into some area. I have a daughter who is majoring in, oh, well, who's just graduated University of Vermont in the arts. So oh. she's looking to possibly become an art teacher. And then one of my other daughters has just graduated in psychology and is going for a master's in social work. Wow. So I do have two. And then I have a third daughter who is actually teaching special education and going for her master's at George Washington University. Wow. So you're talking about your children are in New York City. Yes. 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 Mm, absolutely. And, uh, you live in the city. You told me that you went to California. Well, I went on a Fulbright scholarship. When I finished writing this book, I was awarded a Fulbright scholarship for the innovative use of neuroscience meeting the arts. And mm -hmm. so I actually taught for six months in New Zealand, all through New Zealand and Australia through Victoria University in Australia. And what I did was teach therapists, social workers, as well as caregivers through the Alzheimer's Association in New Zealand and Australia, how to use this methodology and how to use arts in people's daily lives uh, by using a theme. For instance, if I were to give you a seashell and I'd say, Judy, give me some idea that you have about this seashell. What might you say? What, what ideas come to mind? Uh, it comes from the sea. It's a nice shape. Some of them have nice colors. And, and if I said to you, well, where was the, when was the last time you were at the beach? Oh my gosh, I was <laughs> about two years ago. <laughs> well, lately, I have to say, I'm not as agile as I was. So I like a pool instead of the beach. <laughs> yeah, but the seashell is a means to get people talking. Uh -huh. See, that's the point. I could find out more about you mm -hmm. through giving you a, an object, like a seashell. I could right. find out that you haven't been to the beach, even though yes. we are here in East Hampton. Right. There's the most beautiful <laughs> beach in the world. But that's a window into who you are. Uh -huh. So then I could find out more about you and where you do spend your time. You see? So that's how themes are used, to mm -hmm. enhance individuals' communication with each other and verbalizing. Because the more we talk and speak, again, we're creating well mental abilities. Right, right. What's this because, as I said before, when I was with elderly people and they be took them to like a, to a social gathering, they didn't gain anything. Uh, I mean, this, well, this would have been just really more wonderful. And, that's uh, very interesting you say that, that they didn't gain anything because mm -hmm. people tend not to know how to speak to the person who's aging. Right. And that's right. very powerful what you said because, mm -hmm. in fact, what we look to do now is to speak to them about their past because mm -hmm. our past is held <coughs> in our long-term memory. So do you remember, for instance, your kindergarten teacher? Yes, I do. See, that's mm -hmm. a long-term memory. So if we talk to the older individual through their past, they'll open up a whole set of stories to tell you because it's cherished information, mm -hmm. and they also have a lot of detail about that information. So that's what the TAP method does. It shows therapists how to interact better with the older person, what kinds of questions to ask, and how to engage them.